Welcome to David's Community Bible Church this morning. We hope you'll sing along with us as we worship our great God. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. serve a great God. And if you would uh, welcome to your homes via the camera this morning, Pastor Danny Evans to give us our announcements today. Well, welcome to David's Community Bible Church live stream. Uh, we are so glad you are tuning in. If you are, if you're not a regular tender of David's and you're catching the live stream, we'd love to have a record of your visit um, to our site. So just if you would, if you'd look on your app or on the computer on our website, you have, uh, you have a, a contact card you could fill out. 
And if you find that and fill it out, uh, we do appreciate it. How are we going to get them a Dunkin' card? They're not here. How are we going to get them a Dunkin' will Dunkin'? email you a Dunkin' I, I Donuts will email you a Dun- I so. think uh, we'll say when, when the church is able to open back up, come on in. Listen, I get prizes out to the youth, and I email the Dunkin' card. You, you can email it. it out. It's easy. I, it's I, easy. We'll email you a Dunkin' card. I'll show them how to do it. We'll email you <laughs> Danny will card. help me figure out how to email so Dunkin' cards. Fill out the comment card, connection card, and send it in. It's on the website or the app. Because we'd love to have a record of your visit. And we'd love, once, uh, once we get back to um, services v- together um, here in person, we'd love for you to come visit us there as well. Same great preaching, same great worship, and, and even better fellowship. So come on out. We'd love to have it when we open back up. But in the meantime, we do have a lot of exciting things happening for you guys um, from a social distancing level online. We have, if you're in youth group age, um, that's uh, 6th through 12th grade, we have a lot of exciting stuff. We have Youth Group Live tonight at 6 p.m. on Instagram, and we have it every week. We have a youth group uh, together on Instagram at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights, and we'd love to have you tune in tonight. We also have uh, some student-led Bible studies uh, during the week on Instagram as well, uh, Bible Studies for One. If you aren't tuning into that, that's a, a great opportunity there, and we have small groups for all the different age levels. So we have our, your small group leaders will contact you via Zoom and we get to meet together. Uh, just a great time. And on Instagram is where those times are. So we have a lot of exciting stuff if you're in youth group age that we'd love to connect with and be a part of. And we also have that for, uh, for children and families as well. We're doing a family Bible fun uh, activity time that's on the website as well. Some of you guys may already have gotten some uh, snail mail. You guys remember that before email and stuff where you just mail stuff? Uh, some, some of you families out there, we sent, as many as we could, we sent out some uh, snail mail with activity sheets and things like that. They go with the, uh, the videos on the website for family uh, Bible fun. And if you didn't get one of those, you can print them off on the website and uh, do that together as a family. Grow closer to Christ and grow closer together as a family. So uh, Wednesday night. Bible study at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook. This is Pastor Allen's small group. He will lead that at 6.30 p.m. on on Facebook. Some prayer time and time in God's Word. Um, So a lot of if you if you know if you if you need some content during this time if you're if you're looking for ways to connect there's a lot of ways to connect here at David's Community Bible Church and if you visit our website you can see the different places to connect uh, the 250 year anniversary celebration is postponed we announced that last week but this week something crazy happened we uh, we got rid of the event on on Facebook Sanctus Surreal the concert that we were going to have. So we got rid of the event because it's because it's postponed, and it said that it was canceled all over Facebook. So if you got that notification, it is not canceled. It is postponed. Some of you guys were excited. Uh, can't wait to see Sanctus Surreal. We're still going to get them here. Uh, we're just not sure the date yet, and when we, we do, we will let you know. If you would like to give, you can do so on the app or mail it into the office, and we will uh, we'll get that as well, and we would appreciate that. That's uh, a way we, we keep reaching out to the families in our community, and that is something we're still doing. If you know a, a family that's in need, or if your family is in need, as this quarantine keeps going longer and longer, uh, don't hesitate to call the office. Uh, the office hours are 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. You can call, you can leave a message, or you can email us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And We'd love to help out our community. We'd love to help out our, our body, our congregation during this time. So if you, if you become aware of any needs, uh, let us know. Let's pray. God, I just uh, thank you. Thank you for this, this church. God, I thank you for uh, this body of Christ, David's Community Bible Church, that during this time uh, has a heart and desire to reach out and meet the needs of those around us in our community. God, I know there's people in our body that are hurting right now. God, I pray for those that are sick. I pray for those that are hurting because of, of this uh, quarantine lockdown, God. God, I pray. I pray as a, as a church we're able to, to surround them. We're able to, to give them comfort and show your love. And God, I pray. God, I pray for, for this to be resolved quickly, God. I pray. I pray that we are able to meet again soon. We can see each other in fellowship and and worship together once again. So God, I pray for those uh, in the medical profession. God, I pray for those that are researching vaccines. God, I pray for our, our government, our officials. Give them wisdom. And God, I pray that, that we, you use this to draw us closer to you and closer together. I pray this in your name. Amen.
We're going to introduce a song to you this morning called Graves into Gardens. And uh, Pastor Allen's going to be preaching on the sovereignty and the power, the almighty power of God as he preaches through Acts 5. And um, this song just so awesomely declares that uh, he is all powerful. He's the only one who can save. He's the only one who knows all things. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. So this is Graves into Gardens. Search the world, but it couldn't fail me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and raised me from. Satisfied hearing you love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Turn morning to 
song here with our song service uh, with a song called 
all my ways are known to you. And uh, I realized we we're going to be in chapter 5 of Acts and the, obviously the biblical account of Ananias and Sapphira. And the thing about the omniscience, the all-knowingness of God is this, is that if you're walking in his ways and you're obeying him and you're walking in his wills, then the fact that he knows all of your ways is, is very comforting to you. But if you're not walking in his ways and you're lying to the Holy Spirit, you're, you're not uh, obeying him, then the fact that he knows all of your ways is a very <laughs> frightful thing, is a fearful thing. So this song has a lot of comfort in the fact that uh, he knows all of our ways. But I just want you to think about as we sing this song, the omniscience, the, the all-knowing power of God, that he knows the innermost thoughts of our hearts, the innermost motives of, of that, that are within us. So um, think about that as we sing this song, All My Ways Are Known to You.
you are singing along there in your living rooms, and please welcome uh, Pastor Allen as he comes to preach the Word of God from Acts to us today. Okay. Take this thing off. I don't, it makes me feel. It makes me feel uncomfortable. All right. Even here, where we have some of our snafus, that was my fault. I totally forgot to put the microphone on this morning. So uh, sorry about that. But hopefully you can hear me okay with this. So Acts chapter five is where we are this morning. We've been going through the book of Acts these past few weeks. We're starting our study of Acts because it's coinciding with our 250th anniversary as a church. And we're excited about that. Even in this time of coronavirus, we're excited about that. God is still working. God is still moving. Even though we, we can't be here together for now, God is still at work at David's Community Bible Church, and we praise him and thank him for that. Isn't it good to know, as you're turning in your Bibles, hopefully, isn't it good to know that, that when we come to God's Word, we come to a standard of absolute truth? That, that this is the only place, and if, if this isn't something that's becoming clearer and clearer to you in these days, th this, is, this is what we need. We need truth in these days. You know, you, you open your newspaper, you turn on your, your TV, wherever you might be, and one of the frustrating things is, is uh, we don't see truth. We, we don't know what's true. But when we come to God's Word, we have absolute uh, reliability, authority, and truthfulness of God's Word. So it's a comfort in these times that we can go before God's Word and know that this is the truth here. So Acts chapter 5 is where we'll be. It's the beginning of the church. The church is just weeks old. There's over 10,000 people that have responded to the gospel, at least in this time. The church is rapidly growing. It will continue to rapidly grow throughout the book of Acts and beyond. Um, so it's growing, and that growth has has uh, drawn the attention of the Jewish authorities. The Jewish authorities have seen the, the growth of the church and they've already begun in these first weeks of the church to persecute the church. They've already come before the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. Pretty soon they'll be in trouble as well with the, the Gentiles as well. So, so persecution has started already in the book of Acts. And as we read through the book of Acts, you'll see in every chapter of Acts uh, the, the very present reality of persecution. The church was born in the persecution. It was persecuted from its very birth. And we'll see that throughout the books as we study. And what we've seen for the past few weeks, speaking of persecution, is largely and mostly external persecution. The Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, pretty soon we'll see the Gentiles and the Romans persecute. So we're always very aware and cognizant of external persecution against the church of Jesus Christ, right? It's very, a very real reality, even in the world we live in today. But what we'll see today is a different type of danger, and I would say probably even a greater danger than external persecution in the church, and the greater danger is internal sin in the church. You know, we can become so focused on what's going on outside of the church and the persecution that may be coming against us, we forget about the, the purity, the orthodoxy, the doctrine, the, the, the importance of, of holiness inside the church, inside Christians, the members of the church. Sometimes we, we, we forget about that by focusing on the external when realizing the greatest danger to the church of Jesus Christ is not from without, it's from within. It's from within. We're going to see that today in the, in, the, in the very sad story of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Acts 5, 1. This is God's word for us today. But a na man named Ananias and with his wife Sapphira uh, sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why have you, contri why have you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but you've lied to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out to bury him and buried him. Verse 7, after an interval... 
About three hours, his wife, Sapphira, came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for, for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Uh, but Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately, verse 10, immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Let's end there for our time this morning. God has blessing to his word this morning. Let's go before him now and ask him to bless our time in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that wherever we might be today in our homes and watching uh, online or wherever, maybe we watch this later, Lord, wherever we are, whatever circumstance and situation we are in, Lord, may our hearts and minds turn to you today. May you protect us and care for us strengthen us, Lord. Give us peace today. Let us cast our cares upon you. May we trust in you today, Lord. May today be a day, even though we're not physically together, may be a, a day that you work in our midst, that you work in David's church, Lord, and you do a work in each of, of those that are listening today, Lord. Lord, help us to not regard sin in our hearts. Help us to not turn a blind eye at, at, at the, the, the sin that, that we so easily fall into, Lord. May we have a high view of your holiness and a high view of our sin, realizing that we are still sinners. And, but by the mercy of God, Lord, we don't fall dead like Ananias and Sapphira today, Lord. Help us to realize that, do a work in our hearts. May your Holy Spirit come in power and may his presence be felt in our lives. May he be illuminating our hearts and minds as we look at your word uh, together today, Lord. Lord, be with those right now, even now, that are in harm's way, Lord, whether it be those that are working on the front lines in our, in our hospitals and doctor's office, treating people with the coronavirus and others, Lord, protect them. We thank you for them. Lord, we pray for our first responders. We pray for our military people, Lord. Uh, we pray for those who put themselves uh, in harm's way for us to serve us, Lord. Bless them and watch over them today. Be with our families. Be with those uh, that are sick, Lord, even some uh, in our congregation struggling with sickness, and I pray that you would be close to them, you would heal them, Lord. Uh, be with families even now from our church and extended family members that are dealing with this virus right now. Comfort them, uh, protect them, uh, keep them well and healthy in this time, Lord. Restore those that are sick, restore them to health, Lord. Uh, Lord, help, help us, those of us too, who are feeling frustrated and, and, and angry. And, 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 and Lord, I just pray that you'd, you'd help us as well, Lord. Wherever we might be and fall on, on, in this day, Lord, may our answer, whether it's, it's to battle back against fear, to battle back against anger, whatever, whatever, wherever we may be, may our answer be the same. And that's to look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to do that, Lord. And help us, Lord, as we look into Acts chapter 5, to teach us and to instruct us and encourage us today. We need it so uh, desperately, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So Acts chapter 5, as I said, is a real reminder to us and a real warning to us that the greatest danger for Christians and the church, whether it's the, the early church in Acts or even 2,000 years later at our church, is eternal sin, is accepting and celebrating and allowing sin in the body of Christ. This is a huge danger for us and one that we seldom talk about or address. So Acts chapter 5 is the perfect chapter for this because that's what this is about. That's what this is about, that we need to be constantly vigilant for sin in the body. To accept sin as a Christian in the church is lethal for the church. It's a huge detriment. We have to be constantly vigilant, whatever it might be, false teaching, uh, preaching and teaching that tickles the ears, that's not of, of, of the word of God. We need to be vigilant against that. We need to watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible talks that many will come in, especially in the latter days, and be wolves preying on other Christians in the body of Christ as wolves, not sheep. We need to be careful that we're not accepting sin or falling into the trap of moral relativism. The acceptance of sin and, 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 and cultural compromise that we're following after the world and we're not reflecting Jesus Christ. We're reflecting the cultural norms of our day. We have to be careful against as a church. We have to be careful of churches and teachers who reject the authority of the scriptures. 
who use the scriptures as a storybook and, and dip in, dip their toe in and out whenever they want, but they don't let the authority and the truthfulness of God's word reign in the church. We have to watch out, be vigilant against that. Watch out for how the gospel gets changed into a social gospel or social justice. Watch out for, for, for compromise and, and for our, our academic institutions that train pastors and teachers and leaders, our seminaries, our Bible college, producing progressive liberals who reject God's word. Be vigilant. Watch out for sin in the body of Christ. This is infinitely more dangerous than external persecution. Allowing sin to reign in the body of Christ. It's a huge problem in the early church, and it's a huge problem today. And, and here's our warning, and our warning is titled this, Ananias and Sapphira. There's our warning today. And, and what do we know about these two? Well, let, let, let's just lay some things down that, that, that we know about these two. This couple, verse 1 of chapter 5, a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Let, let, let's just stop there. What do we know? Well, we know this about them. We know that they're believers in Jesus Christ. They're part of the church. It would be real easy to, 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 to say, oh, these are, these are uh, demonic, evil people. Let's, let's not even go there. Th th that's not what's happening. These are people that are accepted and part of the body of Christ at this time. They're probably saved at Pentecost. They've been part of the church. They've shared in the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? I know that because Peter holds them to the highest standard, which is lying to God. You don't hold a pagan to that standard. You hold a Christian to that standard. All pagans can do is lie to God. So we know these people were part of the church. These are believers. We're going to see Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. That's where they're going to be. That, that's where they are. So these are believers, okay? Don't let yourself off the hook by saying, oh, these are, these are unbelievers that God's judging. These are Christians. God will discipline his children sometimes severely. Sometimes severely. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the one, the one that he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives. Str Listen to this. Listen to this. Striking dead Ananias and Sapphira is an act of God's discipline. Yea, it is an act of love on God's behalf. God is a loving and good God. That is why he strikes them dead. So it says he disciplines those he loves. This is a severe discipline, but a necessary discipline. This is necessary. It is an act of love towards the early church. If this was allowed to be accepted and condoned and winked at in the church, it would have destroyed the early church. And it's also an act of love for Ananias and Sapphira. God calls them home immediately at this time. He is disciplining his church, and God can discipline as a loving father, and sometimes he disciplines severely his children. They're believers. Secondly, they're givers. They're givers. They're giving to the church. This is a good thing. It is a good impulse to give to the church. They sold a piece of property, and they intended to give it to the church. That, that, that's good. Giving is good. And let me just say this while we're on the topic of giving. David's church is a generous giving church. It's a blessing to be a pastor. It's, it's amazing, and, and it's a great blessing to see the, the offerings continue to come in. Like I've said last week, our offerings are up in this time, which is amazing to me. Why? Because God is good and because we have mature givers in this church. That's something uh, to, to praise God for. But they're givers. They're, they're, their intention is good. Let's give to the church. Let's sell a piece of property just like, just like Barnabas did two verses before. Let's do what he did. Let's sell property and give it to the church. Hey, that's good. This is a good thing. Now, the New Testament, and this is very early, of course, in the early church, and a lot of this hasn't been written, but the New, New Testament um, teaches us New Testament principles for giving. They're different than the Old Testament principles, right? We know this. And, and just to give you a short, you see in your notes or, or if you look up the, in the app later, you'll see this. But I, I just put down 10 principles for giving. We, ha we have all through the New Testament, 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and chapters 9 are great chapters to go to. Paul's teaching the church about how to give and what it means to be givers. Okay, you see this in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Again, this hasn't been taught yet. 
Ananias and Sapphira don't know a lot of this, but, but we have New Testament giving. Um, let's just go through these quickly. And, and if you want to come back to this and maybe study those chapters, that would be very, very beneficial. Uh, first of all, we know that the, the giving, the tithe, is not commanded in the New Testament. The tithe was 10%. It was a commanded law in the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, we don't have that command to tithe, although the 10% principle is a good principle to, to give on. That you should be giving 10%, at least, even as a New, New Testament Christian. Not because you're commanded to, but because it's a good thing. Secondly, we know that giving, our giving is to go to the church. You see, they lay it at the feet of the apostles. Now, you can give personally. You can give to organizations on your own. But God has commanded, as a believer and a part of a church, that your giving, the majority of your giving, goes to the church. And the church distributes that. That's the way that God set this up. Not saying you can't give personally, but there is a responsibility that the church you worship in is the church that you're giving to. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It even says that we should give the first day of the week, Sunday. You'll see that. Uh, thirdly, giving is proportional to our income. Not all of us give the same because not all of us make the same amount of money. That's okay. It's individual. Fourthly, giving is sacrificial. Right, right in the beginning of the church, we're seeing an example of giving. Barnabas gives, and he gives sacrificially. How do I know he gives sacrificially? Because he sold property. He didn't have the money at hand in his bank account, but there was a need. He says, but I have property. Let me sell that, and let me give it to the church. That's sacrificial. Sacrificial. You give beyond your means. Fifthly, giving is voluntary. You're never forced to give. Giving six is willingly. You decide in your heart between you and God. Your giving is an act of obedience between you and God. Between you and God. And different people give different amounts, but it's, it's not for Pastor Allen or, or the elders of David to tell you how much to give. That's between you and God. And you'll be held accountable for that. that. That's in your heart. You, you willingly give. Seventhly, you plan it out. You give intentionally. You give strategically. You should think about your giving. What are we giving? What are we giving to? How are we giving? These are all thoughts that you and your, your spouse should think through and come up with a plan. It's not willy-nilly when you walk into church, hey, how much do you have in your pocket? Let's give that. This should be strategic and should be planned out and prayed over and decided between you and God and your spouse. Or if you're not married, between you and God. Planned out. Intentional. Eighthly, giving is individual. It's different for each of us. Ninth, ninthly, giving is done cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. Christians should be cheerful givers. And, and sometimes in the beginning, it's a duty to give. It's a duty to give. I can remember my kids, when we, when we began to talk about 10%, they were shocked at 10%. What? I got to give a, every, a dollar out of every $10? And then they were even more shocked when their taxes came due. They take more than 10% in your taxes. It's a wake-up call when you begin to make money and you begin to see how much money's not yours, really. But, but that's part that we put in and we do it cheerfully. We do it individually. We pan it out. We do it willingly. And giving in the New Testament is rewarded. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says that if you, if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And I don't believe that's a, that's a money for money formula. I believe that if you give of your time and your talents and, and your resources and your abilities and your monies, God will bless you in all sorts of intangible ways. That's how it works. That's New Testament giving. Now, again, we can't hold Ananias and Sapphira to that standard. They haven't learned that yet, although we can hold them to the standard of honesty. They know that, and that's their problem. Their problem is not about the giving. They didn't have to give anything. And they didn't have to give it all. They could have said, hey, we just sold a piece of property. We're giving half of it. It would have been fine. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira is that they lied to God. They lied. It's an honesty issue. It's, it's not the amount given. It's their heart motivation in giving. Okay? So we see that they are believers. We see that they're givers. But we see that they are sinners. And their sinful inclinations really drove their, their, their giving. And they sin in two ways. They sin in two ways. They sin with their actions, right? These are, this is, they, they sin. What, what did they do? They sin. They lied to God. P Peter says very clearly, you have not lied to men. You have lied to God. So they sin in their what? Their actions. They lied. And because they lied and said they gave it all, they were also accused of stealing from God. Not only did you lie to God, but you then stole from God because you said, I'm going to give 100%. You didn't give 100% lying and stealing from God because that 100% you gave to him. But they also sinned, and I might even say the greater sin was not in their actions, it was in their hearts. 
That's how sin always starts in our hearts before it gets to our actions. Their why, why did they sin? They sinned because their heart, their, the, the motivation was in their heart. They wanted to be seen as something that they weren't. They wanted to be like Barnabas. That was their heart motivation. We call that hypocrisy. They were hypocrites. They, they, they said one thing, but they did something else. They wanted people to think that they were something that they weren't. We, we sin with, with actions and heart all the time. We do what sins and why sins all the time. You know, in the New Testament, you see these sins are easily e- 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 broken out. You know, what sins? Action sins. You see prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, right? They're, they're drawn to Jesus. Their sin is clear. Their, their, their actions are clearly sinful. But then you also see a, a lot of heart sinners, a lot of why sinners, right? These are the Pharisees. These are the Pharisees. These are the rich young ruler. These are the ones who have, their, their heart is corrupt. And these are the why sins, the heart motivation sins. And a lot of times we're more tripped up with the why sins, our heart sins. Why we do certain things, not what we do. It's clear that, that, that the what's, these are the actions I shouldn't, I shouldn't behave in. But a lot of times we can't, we can't look at the heart. We don't know why. These are the, the sins that Jesus especially gets angry about. The, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Their hearts, they gave, they served, they did all the stuff. They checked all the boxes, the Pharisees, to look like a good Christian, but Jesus knew that their hearts were corrupt. They weren't doing that out of a heart of love for God. They were doing it as a hypocritical heart to let everybody see, let everybody see how great of a, of, a, of a believer they were. These are the heart motivations. And a lot of times we're tripped up with these sins, aren't we? When we're really truthful with each other, these are the sins we struggle with. I know in my life, these are the sins I struggle with. Um, when, when, when we have guests over, I love to do this. I love this. Here's a, here's a personal confession from Pastor Allen. When guests come over at our house, we, we serve the team, usually cooks for them, we have a great, and usually uh, I get up and do the dishes. I get up and do the dishes. Let me clear the table. Let me go do the dishes. I never do dishes except when there's guests over. And, and never, all right? But when guests are over, I'm the first to take all the dishes and scrape them off and do. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but, but one of the, the big reasons is I want people to think that that's the kind of guy I am. I serve my wife in this way. She cooks, I do the dishes. It's a heart motivation, right? It, 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 I want people to think of me differently than who I really am. That's the same sin of Ananias and Sapphira. They want people to think that they're a Barnabas when they're not a Barnabas. It's our hearts we have to watch. It, it, the point here is that they were sinners, we're sinners. We, we can relate very well to Ananias and Sapphira. Don't judge them harshly because you'll find a lot of it may be directed right back at you. They're just like us. They're believers they have good intentions, but their intentions are governed and driven by the wrong motivations. So what did they do? Well, as we said, they lied to God and they stole from God. Verses two and three. And with the wife's knowledge, Ananias kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter, and of course we know that there's something supernatural going on here. The Holy Spirit is telling Peter the truthfulness of this in verse three. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? They lied to, to, to not to men, they lied to God and they kept some back and by saying they gave 100%, they're stealing from God. They're lying and stealing from God. You know, when, when we sin in the body of Christ, our sin has corporate implications for all of us. You can't be part of a church and worship at a church and fellowship at a church and then sin and that sin not affect the body. The sin, your sin has corporate, a corporate dimension to it. It affects you individually, certainly, but it also affects you corporately. By the way, and this isn't what the point of the sermon is, but by the way, this also happens with the family. When you sin in your family, dads, moms, or your sin affects the family in the same way, even if it's hidden. This is a hidden sin that, that Peter, is, somehow the Holy Spirit reveals to him, but this is a hidden sin. But even your hidden sins, especially your hidden sins within the body of Christ, affect the body of Christ. It's a scary thing. Not just you you're putting in danger. It's not just you. It's, it's the, the body of Christ around you that you're putting into danger. And secondly, we need to realize that our sin is ultimately against God. It's against God. That's what he says. He says, you have lied... In verse four, you have lied, uh, you have not lied to man, but you have lied to God. Sin is ultimately against God. This is what David says after his great sin with Bathsheba and and killing her husband. And in Psalm 51, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. Our sin is against God. 
And, and interesting, uh, this is a great passage to go to when we talk about the Holy Spirit. You see in verse uh, three that he says, uh, you, God, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And then you see in verse five, you have not lied to man, but to God. Again, we see the Holy Spirit is God. If anybody ever says, well, where does the Bible say the Holy Spirit's God? Here's a passage that refers to the Holy Spirit as God as well. He's part of our Trinitarian God. So again, they are lying to God. This is not a sin about giving. It's a sin about lying. It's a sin about hypocrisy in your heart. It's about your heart motivation, not about giving. And if this sin was not judged in the way it was, and this sin was allowed to, to fester and to grow and to be part of the early church, it would have destroyed the early church. That's why God had to judge it in the way that he did. Well, we know who they were. We know what they did. Let's, let's ask maybe the, the, the harder question or the million dollar question. Why did they sin? Why did they do this? Why did they lie to God? I'm going to give you four reasons, I think, uh, that they lied to God. The first one was hypocrisy. They were hypocrites. They were hypocrites. In verse, uh, verse two of our passage, you can see that when they came, they brought the proceeds, only a part of it, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. This process it could have been a public process. They laid it at the apostles' feet. They publicly came and, 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 and laid it there at the apostles' feet. I want everybody to know, Peter, I want you to know that I've sold my, my extra property for $25,000. Here it is. Here it is, when really they sold it for 50000 or whatever. It was a publicly thing. They wanted people to think highly of them. They were spiritual fakers. They were praise seekers. They wanted to be praised like Barnabas was just a few verses before. They wanted to be in the Barnabas category. They wanted to be sons of encouragement. They wanted the church to say, wow, look at Ananias and Sapphira. Aren't they great Christians? Look at them. They're just like Barnabas. Fakers. They're pre pretending to be something they are not for the recognition and the praise of men. Not the praise of God, the praise of men. That's what hypocrisy is. And, and, and like I said, Jesus has very little patience for hypocrisy. In, in Matthew uh, chapter 6, Jesus speaks about giving and he speaks about the, the absolute disaster hypocrisy is when we give. Okay, so he's addressing this very topic. And you wonder, did, did, did they know this teaching? Were they taught this at this time? This is what it says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus is speaking, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward for your Father as heaven. This is exactly what Ananias and Sapphira are doing. They're practicing the righteous, they're giving in front of other people. Verse 2. So and let me give you an example. Jesus says, be careful practice your righteousness in front of other people to be praised by them. Okay, be careful of that. Let me give you an example of how this works. Verse two, thus when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet before them as hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. People think, some commentators think that was a literal thing that the Pharisees would blow a trumpet. So people would, what? What's going on? Oh, Joe Pharisee's giving money to the needy. Let's go watch. So they're, they're, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Verse three, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret may reward you. Giving is to be done in secret between you and God. You know, if, if they had the big checks back then, this would be a big check time. They'd come with the big check and they'd say, here, Peter, come on and come in and get a picture. Get a picture. Sapphire, you stand on the other side. Peter, come stand behind me. Get, get the big, big check in here with our, with, our, with, our, with our faces on it. They're hypocrites. They're like us. They're like us. And Jesus hates hypocrisy. Secondly, they were led by Satan. It, it, it says right there in verse 3, Peter says, first he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? That's a scary statement. Why has Satan worked in your heart for you to, to lie like this? Can Satan fill a believer's heart? Yes, he can. Yes, that's what he's saying. Satan has done a work in your life. Yes, you are a child of God. Yes, you are a Christian. But don't think for a minute Satan doesn't have influence over you, that he, doesn't, that he can't tempt you, that he can't fill your heart. Think of Jesus' own temptation. He was led in the wilderness and, the whole, and, and Satan tempted Jesus, right? Remember this, three temptations. One of them, he showed Jesus in his mind all the kingdoms of the world. Satan got into even Jesus' head in that way. Scary thing. Satan can do a work in your life. He can lead you astray. He can tempt you. He can fill your heart. That's what he did to Ananias and Sapphira. He can do that to us. How does he fill your hearts? Simple. Simple. What do you watch? 
What do you hear? What do you experience? That's how he fills your hearts. What are you allowing to come into your life unfiltered, unguarded into your hearts? What are you allowing in? That, that's how Satan fills your hearts and your minds. Through, through the gates, through your eye gate, your ear gate, and, and through what you experience. This is why we need to guard our hearts and minds above all else as Christians, to guard what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're experiencing, to guard that, to put that through the filter of God's word. You cannot just allow this stuff to be poured down into your heart and your mind and Satan not to use it to tempt you. Do you think you can go online and watch pornography day after day and Satan not fill your heart with lust and, and, and anger and all the things that come out of that life? Of course he can. What are you putting in? Because that's what Satan's filling your life with. And that's what he's filling Ananias' heart with greed. But we know that when we turn aside from that, when we, when, we, when we guard our hearts and minds, Satan can't fill our lives. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Don't allow the, the world to fill your hearts and your minds with sin and let Satan use that in your life. What are you filling your minds and hearts with? They were led by Satan. They were hypocrites. Thirdly, they were greedy. There was a, there was a money element in this. Look at verse four. They bought this and while it remained unsold, private property, this was your property, you owned it. It was yours. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? This is your property, your money, and you're deciding what to do with this. He's affirming this, this private property, this transaction. Why is it that you have contri contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to God, but to me. This was your property. You made this decision. And somehow in your, your, your factoring, you thought, you know, I can get the best of two worlds out of this. I can get that new boat I've wanted or that new car I've wanted, but I can also get recognized in the church. It's a win-win for me. It's a win-win. I can use this money in selfish uh, pursuits of what I want, but I can also get the praise of, of men in my church, men and, and women in my church. It's just great. This is fantastic. The, the word here where he says that you've kept back, you've kept back some of this money in verse uh, three there. You've kept back is literally the word stole. You have stolen from God. Not because this was God's to begin with, but because you said it was God's. You said this is 100% God's and you didn't give 100% to God. Therefore, you stole from God. God holds us to our words. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 6.1 says that when you love money, your life is going to end up in pain. You're going to pierce yourself with many pangs. You're going to get hurt. That's what happens when you love money. You may die. You may die. Like we see the Ananias' fire. They were hypocrites. They were led astray by Satan. They were greedy. They let money and their greed for, uh, interact with this, this, this transaction. And fourthly, they were trying to manipulate God. Not men. You may say, oh, they're trying to manipulate men. They're trying to get the praise of men. Yes, but even, even more so and more dangerous, they were trying to manipulate God. They were trying to, they were trying to manipulate God. Look at verse, verse uh, 9. Ananias dies and then his, his wife comes. And he says to her in verse 9, 5, 9, Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord? They, they are testing God. They're testing the Holy Spirit. They're trying to manipulate him. Well, how are they trying to manipulate the Holy Spirit? Well, they're trying to manipulate him this way. Can I lie? A white lie. Can I lie about my money? Can I receive the praise of the other Christians around me? Can I still receive the blessings of God and all the benefits of the Holy Spirit, everything that's going on in this church, and, and lie about it? Can I, get a, here, can I get away with this? Can I get away with this sin and still be Joe Christian in my church? Can I get away with this sin and have no ramifications? Can I do this? How close of, to the edge can I get as a Christian? Can I flirt with my secretary? Can I dabble in pornography? Can I do these things and still get away with it? That, that's, the, that's the test. That's the test that we put God through all the time. Can I continue in this habitual sin that I've never repented of, that I've never felt sorrow over, that's been part of my life for years? Can I continue in it and still be a good Christian? God's blessing remain on me. Can I remain in unrepentance? Can I remain an immature Christian? I've been a Christian for 80 years and I've never grown. I've never read my Bible. I've never memorized verses. I, I've done none of that. Is God still okay with me? Can I be a greedy, a lust-filled person? 
Can I be a fearful person? Can I be a hypocrite? How far can I go with my faith to the edge and God still love, bless, keep me safe, answer my prayers? How far can I go? This is the test. This is the game that Ananias and Sapphira are playing with God. It's the exact same game we play with God all the time. What can I do? How can I feed my flesh and also feed my faith? Because I want to feed both. Because I like both. I like both a lot. I like my sin. I like, I like things that are going on. I like, I like the, the, the things that are happening in my sinful life. I like pursuing gain and, and things. I like having more things. They make me feel good and secure. And I like having nice things. But I also love God and I, I want to grow in my faith. See, we want the, this is how we test God. How far can I go in the world and God still bless me? This is what I'm not satisfied. Can I lie to God and get away with it? Can I do this? This is the game that we play and we read this and the thing that we should, we should be scared to death of this passage as Christians. This is for us. Again, don't get off the hook by saying, oh, these aren't Christians because that gets you off the hook really easily. You should read this and say, I should be scared to death that God judges sin in this way in his house. We should be scared to death of this. Beware, Christian, discipline is coming and God's discipline sometimes is severe. Sometimes God will kill you physically because of your sin. You squirm about that? Oh, that's Old Testament stuff. Acts 5 is in the New Testament, man. This is after Jesus' death and resurrection. This is us. We're not talking about Achan's sin. Remember Achan and, and Joshua when they came out of, out of Jericho and he took some of the plunder and he hid it and jo Joshua judged him and said, not only you, Achan, but your entire family, get your kids and your grandkids. Oh, you have a new baby? That baby as well is stoned and put to death for that sin. That's a terrible judgment. That's how God said, I do not accept sin in the assembly of God. Akinson, that's Old Testament. Let me tell you, it's New Testament too. Can you imagine the kind of fear if, this, if we saw us walking in these doors on a Sunday morning when we could do that again and fearing God that today may be the day that God judges me for that hidden sin in my life? I may drop dead today because of that hidden sin. God may run out of patience with me and call me home. The church would look a lot different, wouldn't it? We'd have a lot less people worshiping, I'll tell you that. And that's what happens. We'll get to that. But we'll see that they were so scared of this that people respected Christians, but they stayed away from them. That's how much fear came on the people after this. We need a little bit of that fear. That's where we're going. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Discipline is coming. The hypocrisy, greed, led astray by Satan, manipulating God, and God judges them severely. Look at verse five. Let me just read this and see what happens. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and they, they went out and they buried him. And then after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me what that you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, that's what we sold it for. Boom. Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came, and they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Hmm. Maybe we need to, to begin a new ministry description for our ushers on Sunday mornings. Take up the offering, count heads, take care of the nursery. Oh, and keep a couple body bags on hand because God may judge sin. I'll put the fear of God into you. God judges sin. God judges sin. God judges sin. He is sovereign. He is our creator. He made everything. He has all authority over us. He is our sovereign, our judge, our king. He will judge sin. All sin will be judged by God, either in hell or on the cross. Those are the only two places sin can go. He will judge and reconcile all things at the end of time. And he can judge sin. He can judge sin when he wants to, how he wants to, and to any extent that he chooses to judge sin. That's the testimony of the Bible. Read Romans chapter 1. He is storing up for himself a bowl of wrath that he will pour out on this world. Do you think that the coronavirus is the wrath of God being poured out in this world? I say it is. It absolutely is. That's what's going on. God judges, and he can judge how, when, where, to what extent. Sometimes he judges immediately. Sometimes he judges severely. But not often we know that God's mercy covers a multitude of sin, and he's a good and gracious God, and he lets us get away with a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. 
because he's good. And because ultimately our eternal judgment's been poured out in Christ on the cross. But he judges sin. He is the judge of sin. God, let me say it this way. God takes sin seriously, much more seriously than we do. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says that God cannot even look at sin. He's so pure and so righteous. He can't even look on sin. That doesn't mean literally he can't see it. What it means is he can't tolerate it. It makes him sick. It forces him to judge. All sin must be judged because he is a pure and holy God. We take sin far too lightly. We fall into the trap of what's called easy believism and cheap grace. That's what reigns in our churches. It's easy to believe God demands nothing of you. It's easy to believe and his grace is cheap. It's given away at wholesale prices and, it, and you can use it for anything. We laugh at sin in the church. We wink at sin in the church. We allow sin to reign in the church. We call wickedness and rebellion to God. You know what we call it? We call it a struggle. We call it brokenness. You know what it is? It's, it's rebellion to God. It's wickedness. That's what it is. That's what the Bible defines it as. We've so oversold human weakness. Oh, we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. We've so oversold that that there is no room for the holiness of God in the church anymore. It's not there anymore. There's no more room for the demands and the requirements that God places on his children to be holy as I am holy. Where is the holiness of God in the church today? Every time you call God's children holiness, you're accused of being a legalist. How dare you insert the law into grace? You're a legalist because you're calling people to be obedient and submissive and holy to God. That's the church that we live in now. That's the modern church. God takes sin seriously. We cannot presume on God's patience and his mercy any longer. We need to repent. Ananias and Sapphira were given no time to repent. Their judgment was like that. And they're a warning to us that while you have breath in your lungs, even if it's your last breath, repent. Turn to God. Turn to God and repent. Or God may kill you and strike you down. That's what we see here. That's what we see. You say, oh, you're overselling. I'm not overselling. I'm not exaggerating. Read God's word. This is what it says. Can you imagine if this came, if this was the, came back into the church? Can you imagine if God began to hold his holiness in such high regard that he began to strike dead those who continually flaunted sin in his face? I'm not going to wish for that. I'm not going to wish for that. It's a terrible thing, but it could be something that, that God has in store for us. God takes sin seriously. We don't take our sin seriously. You know, God sets the highest standard. Let me tell you something. As a believer in Jesus Christ, God has set the highest standards on you, not the lowest. We think it's the opposite. Now that I'm a Christian, whew, I got my get out of hell free card. Now I can do whatever I want. Now, now sin can abound because grace will abound. Let's just keep going in this. This is great. I don't have to change any way. If anything, I can even become more wicked and more sinful because grace covers a multitude of sins. I'm going to keep going on this trajectory away from God because I'm a Christian now and there's no demands on my life for holiness. There's no demands on my life to be any different than the world around me. Hallelujah, I'm saved by Jesus Christ. Right? That's how we think of sin. I'm under grace, baby. There is nothing I can do to make God love me less or make him love me more. Therefore, I will continue in sin that grace may abound. Hallelujah. You should put that to music because that's what the modern church believes. That's how we live our lives. We have a very low view of sin and that's why the church of today is filled with immature Christians at best and unconverted sinners at the worst. There's a lot of unconverted sinners who sadly think they're believers, but they're not because we have such a low view of sin. We don't even want to talk about sin. We don't even address sin. Jesus says this about his standard. You want to come after me? You want to follow me? You want to be a believer in me? Here's what you need to do. Deny yourself, take up your cross every single day, and follow me. Those are the kind of Christians. Those are the kind of followers that, I, that I'm looking for. You know what the picture? If Jesus, Jesus, what is the picture of, of a Christian? What's a picture of following you? And you just say, oh, it's very easy, death. Death is the best picture of someone who follows me. Every day, they die. Every single day, they die. They die to themselves. They die to their sin. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's a picture of death. What do they do with crosses? What do they do with Jesus as he carried his cross out of Jerusalem? They nailed him to it. Every day, I want you to go to your funeral, your death. That's what it looks like to follow me, to kill sin in your life, to kill yourself so that I can reign in your life. That's the picture of following Jesus Christ in the Bible. That's not the picture that we have. We, we, we are, and, and again, we are saved by grace through faith, right? Hallelujah. We are saved by grace. But once we are saved, God expects of us and requires of us to kill off sin in our lives. He expects us to grow in holiness. He expects us to grow in obedience to him. That's his expectation for us, 
That's his requirement for us. Ananias and Sapphira should scare us to death as modern Christians. Because we're worse than Ananias and Sapphira. This is nothing compared to the stuff that we try to pull off with God. This is nothing. This little lie got them killed. This little thing lying about money. Think of the stuff that we do. Think of the stuff, the, the, the hypocrisy in our lives. We are pretenders. We are fakes. We are frauds. We need to repent. This is a warning to us to repent. We need to repent while there's still time. Turn back to God. Turn back to God. Kill off sin in your life. Seek holiness and his righteousness. And nice as fire had no chance to repent. They were immediately struck down dead because it was a warning. It's a warning to the rest of the church. While you have time, while you have breath in your lungs, repent. You know, and, and you look at this and say, what, what, it's amazing. They didn't kill anybody. They, they, they didn't kill anybody. Ananias isn't cheating on his wife. He's not running a prostitution ring. They're not selling drugs. This little lie that they didn't give everything they said they gave, that's such a small thing. And God struck them dead. And we're amazed that God would judge so severely over such a small sin, but we should be amazed at the opposite thing. We should be amazed that God doesn't strike us dead for all the sins that we commit and the sin that we harbor in our heart and that we love that we hide away in some, some deep, dark closet in our heart. We hide it there and we, we take it out every once in a while because that's our pet sin. That's our, our favorite thing that we like to indulge in. We should marvel over God's grace and his mercy for us that we are not consumed, that we are not consumed by his holiness. The coronavirus, this time that we're going through for the believer in Jesus Christ, this is a time to repent. This is a warning to the world. This is a huge warning. This is God's warning to us. Life is not the end of it. Your physical life is not the most important thing. Your spiritual life is. We have souls that are going to live on forever. This is a time to take stock of our lives, to think about, to repent, to turn back to God. This is the judgment of God in his mercy on this world. We're all experiencing the same time. This is an opportunity for the world to turn back to God to get our priorities straight, to realize what we've missed, to realize how we've regarded sin, how we've lived our own way, to say, we need to stop that. This is, this is a chance for us as the, as the people of God to fear God again, to love him, to kill sin, to be holy. This is our opportunity to lead the way in this. We need to repent. We need to repent. God takes sin seriously. We don't. We need to and we need to repent. The end result of this story, which is, I think, why it's a warning to us, is the result. What happens as a result to Ananias and Sapphira dying? What happens in the church? Something amazing happens. Verse 5, 5-5. Five, five. He fell down dead, breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. Verse 11. Sapphira dies. They carry her out. The same people just buried her husband, bury her, and great fear came upon the whole church and all upon who heard these things. Fear, the fear of the Lord. That's the, that's the result of this. And why was the early church filled with fear? Why were they afraid? Well, they're afraid because they, that could happen to them. Wait a minute. God, God's taking names and, he, and, and he's going after, that could happen to me. I'm a sinner like that. Seeing someone struck dead like that can put the fear of God right into you. Put the fear of God right into you. Remember in the Old Testament, in, in, in 2 Samuel, they're, they're bringing the ark. They're bringing the ark back to Jerusalem, right? And they're not doing it the right way. And Uzzah, just, just a great guy, right? Not, not a, not, not a, and he reaches out because the ark's about to, to topple over. And he goes to, what happens to him? He's struck dead like this. David gets so afraid when he sees this. Suddenly, David's had an experience with the holiness of God and the righteousness of God. And he sees this and he's scared to death. He says, you know what? I'm not bringing the ark to Jerusalem. Put it in this guy's house. He's scared. To bring the, he realizes, I'm not messing around with, 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 with some regular God here. It is a fearful thing, Hebrews 10 says, to fall in the hands of the living God. Fear, real fear, settles into David. He says, I'm not, I'm not willing to bring the ark in right now because we're not doing it the right way. And, and there's a, there a terrible and awesome and fearful God. They could die. They could be judged. Not, not eternally. We don't believe that. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation. But they could be judged on the spot. And you look at this and, and you say, well, this would never happen to me. <laughs> really? That, that's the choice. That's the chance you want to take. This ain't, this ain't coming for you. That's not a good chance to take. God is holy. He hates sin and he will discipline his children and he will judge this world and judge all sin. This is a lesson we have to learn. This is a lesson we have to learn. 
Matthew 10, 20, it says, fear him who can cast both body and soul. Now, don't fear the coronavirus. Don't, feel man, don't fear men who can kill the body. Fear him who can cast both your body and your soul. Now, that's who you should fear. And Romans 3, 18 says, here's the, the when, when you are in sin, those who don't know Jesus, one of the, the, the implications of that is that there's no fear of God before their eyes, right? That's our, that's, our, that's our genius governor from New York saying, God didn't do this. We did this. You know what that is? That's not fearing God. Why do they fear God? Because they realize that God has this high standard of holiness and they could die themselves. What is the fear of God? Let me quickly go through this. The fear of God, two, two parts of the fear of God, awe and dread. Awe and dread. We stand in awe of God. We worship God. We reverence him. We, we honor him. A lot of times in the New Testament, that's the only way we define the fear of God, that this overcoming awe and, and worship, and that's part of it, but that's not enough of it because there's a dread as well. There's a dread. It's like if you grew up in a healthy family, and I pray that you did, you had a healthy fear of dad, didn't you? You had a fear. You, you might have been in awe of my dad. My dad is the strongest, the best guy ever. You know, that's when your kids are little, they say, dad, you're the best. You're, you're great. You know, you have that awe of your dad, but you also have a little bit of fear because dad has a belt around his waist and sometimes he'll take that belt off and he'll give you a good weapon with it. That's how it used to happen. They don't do that so much anymore. But you, you, had, a, you had a healthy fear of dad because he was a disciplinarian. He had authority over you. That's the same thing with God. He loves us, but he'll discipline us. There should be an awe of God and there should be a certain amount of dread because he is God almighty. He is God Almighty. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's more than all. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You know, I think one of the places that, that really sums this up well, and I, I love this quote um, from the Chronicles of Narnia. This is in the first book when, when Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, they, they escape to the beavers, they're hiding, and, and they haven't seen Aslan yet. They're just hearing his name, uh, the, the, the children, and they're talking about Aslan. Who is that? Oh, Aslan's a lion. And I love this quote. I've used it before because I think it just captures this, this awe and dread so well. And th this is the fear of God. Here's, a, here's a, what, what I really think uh, teaches us this. And this is the dialogue. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. That's what Mr. Beaver says. Ooh, Susan says, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's a lion. But he's good, he says. He's the king, I tell you. See how that captures the awe and the dread of the fear of God? Lions aren't safe. God is not safe. If you're following Christianity for safeness, there's no, there's not a safe. It's the fear of God. This is what we see. So one more question. Do we fear God? The fear of God should fill his church. The church of Jesus Christ should be a safe place for those that are hurting. For women, like we read in John chapter four, the woman at the well, this should be a safe place where they see the acceptance and the love of God. That, that's, that's what the love of God does. It should be a safe place for those that are hurting, where they should experience, maybe for the first time in life, acceptance and love of God. But at the same time, the church should be an unsafe place for hypocrites, for Pharisees, for rich young ruler types. It should be an unsafe place for them. This is a place where they should find rebuke and they should find a challenge for their, 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 their heart motivations for sin. You know, meeting God is not like meeting a celebrity, okay? That's how we think, oh, it's gonna be so great when I meet God. It's gonna be like, you know, high fives and autographs and it's gonna be great. That's not what it's like. That's not how it's like to meet a lion, right? We just read in Aslan's quote. You will be flat on your face before God Almighty. That's the fear of God. Churches should be places where we encounter God in all of his glory and all of his power and all of his holiness and we should fear him. That's what this passage is getting at. That the body of Christ, even in its beginning, needed to be a place where the fear of God filled the, 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 the place. Not the acceptance of sin. We're not going to accept sin. That what's going to fill this place and what we're going to be known for is the fear of God. That's what the church should be. That's what the people of God should be. A church should be a place where God can rip apart our selfishness and our sinfulness and our egos. No one should come into church and leave church with any ego intact. It should all be about God. It should be a place where God can painfully rip away our deepest and darkest sins. You know, just another, another great example from C.S. Lewis in, in a later book, the, the Dawn Treader, one of the boys, Eustace, becomes a dragon, right? He becomes this dragon. 
And, and Aslan comes to him and says, you know, do you want me to make you into a, a boy again? He says, yeah. He says, but I have to take off your, your, your skin, your dragon skin. He says, oh, that's very painful. And Aslan comes with his claws and he rips apart this, this boy. He rips off and it's painful. Have, has God ever ripped apart your life? Has he ever ripped apart your sin? It's painful. It's very painful. That's what the picture is. This is a picture of God exposing us and stripping us naked for the frauds that we are, the pretenders that we are, and he's ripping us apart so that nothing remains of us except God. That should happen in the church every single Sunday. We should encounter the fear of God here every single Sunday as we gather together. And that's what God is ensuring in Acts chapter five. This is how I want the church to be. This is when my people get together, when my children assemble together in the church, the fear of God should fill the place. The church should be. How do we grow in the fear of God? We should fear God. I'll tell you a simple way. Spend time with God. I, I, can't, I, I can elaborate, but I don't need to. Spend time with God. Spend time with God in his word, listening to preaching, prayer. Spend time with God. And when you fear God, let me tell you one of the benefits of fearing God. When you fear God, you will fear nothing else. You will not fear man. You won't fear coronavirus. You won't fear sickness. You won't fear death even. You will fear nothing because you fear God first. Spend time with him. Repent and turn to him and you grow in the fear of God. Real quickly, I just want to point out to you the, re the results of this church. So the, the fear of God came upon them. That's what God wanted, the fear of God to, to permeate and to fill this church, okay? And then in verses 12 to, to 16, we see the, the outworkings of that. The first thing we see of a church that fears God, we see that it's a pure church. Great fear came upon all the whole church, purity. The whole church felt great fear. The church is still in its infancy and they can't allow sin in its ranks like we said. Accepting sin in the early church would have killed it, would have destroyed it. So God makes sure that this is a pure church. He judges sin severely. Secondly, we see the power of God in, in a church that fears him. Verse 12, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles and they were all together in Solomon's portico. They're teaching boldly in the temple at Solomon's portico and great signs and wonders are confirming the message is true. Power. This is a church that fears God and has the power of God in it. God is working in their midst. In, in this instance, he's working through signs and wonders, right? God is confirming his mission through signs and wonders. That's not the, the, the primary where God confirms his, his power today. It's in other ways, through his word, right? And, and just, just to give you an aside here, we see two, let's say two issues, two problems with miracles right from the beginning. Verse 15 says, so when they even carried out the sick onto the streets and laid them on cots and mats that Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. That's superstition. That wasn't, most commentators say he's not healing people by his shadow, but he's healing people say, oh, if we could just get him near Peter and his shadow can fall. So when signs and wonders are a big part of church, superstition gets in there. And secondly, they lose their focus on the gospel. Look at verse 16. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits that they might be healed. Not that they might hear the gospel, but they might be healed. This is why signs and wonders are not always what we think they are. People long for signs and wonders. Well, when you have a lot of signs and wonders, church, you're going to have superstition and you're going to lose focus on the gospel. That's why we don't have signs and wonders like today like we did then. It draws us, most people, away from the gospel. I could preach a whole sermon on that, but I just want to touch on that briefly. But there's power in the church. Secondly, people are scared of the church. They're scared of what God is doing. Look at verse 13. None of the rest dared to join them. That's the, the people, the unsaved, but the people held them in high esteem. They were scared to go near the church. They were afraid of the church. They were scared of what God was doing in the church. Can you imagine if the world today was scared of the church, feared what was going on in the church? Can you even imagine that scenario? The world doesn't fear the church today. Oh, not at all. We're non-essential. We've been, we've, been, we've been given a new title, non-essential. We're non-essential. We're, we're growing out of all that. The world doesn't fear the church. If anything, they have nothing but scorn and, and mocking for the church of God today. We don't, you know, and, and the world might fear the church if the church feared God. If they saw the fear of God in the church, maybe they'd fear God. But we're non-essential. We're mocked. We're mocked. We're, 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 the world boldly proclaims, God didn't do this. God's not active here. Why are you praying, you fool? This is what's going on. In the world. There's no fear of God in the world because there's no fear of God in the church. How much longer can, can God in his patience tarry? How much longer can he put up with this? But for the sake of the elect, right? God, there'd be none left. 
There'd be none left. This is the condition of the world. Purity. The God of fears, the Lord has a purity, has power, has people scared, has people saved. Verse 14 says there's multitudes. There's no more numbers in Acts. We saw these numbers, 3,000, 5,000, but there's so many coming now. Just referred to as multitudes. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. Multitudes were coming. And what comes with multitudes? What comes with gospel effectiveness? Persecution comes, verse 17. But the high priest rose up. And all that were with him, that is the party statues, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles. This is what happens. This is, this is what happens. The fear of God, when it, when, it, when it reigns in the church, when it permeates the church, we have a high view of God's holiness. We have a high view of our sin. We repent. We are people of repentance. We fear God, right? We, we fear God. And when the church fears God, that will be a pure church that God can be powerful and can use powerfully. And he'll use us so powerfully that those around us may respect us, but they'll, they'll, be, they'll be scared of us in a sense. And people will be bound by the multitudes. People will be saved by the multitudes and persecution will happen. Look at those five things. We don't see those in the modern church today. We don't see a pure church. We don't see a powerful church. We don't see a church that scares anybody. If anything, we're mocked and maligned like never before. We don't see a church that's winning large converts for Jesus Christ. And when we do, we win them to a manby-pamby religion anyways. And we don't see persecution or very little. Maybe growing. So what do we need to do today? Let's wrap this up. Man and I, Sapphire, is an example to us is an example to us, an example and, and, a, and a reason for us to repent, to fear God, to seek God, to have a high view of God's holiness, to have a high view of God, and to have a high view of your sin, that your sin is worse than you can ever imagine. Repent of your sin. And, and we look at Ananias and Sapphira as representative of us. And as you read this and think about this, my question that I want to, you to think about from this sermon is very simple. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? If you are Ananias and Sapphira, if you are a spiritual faker and a fraud and a hypocrite, if you've allowed sin in your heart, if you've allowed to wink at sin and laugh at sin and and forget about sin, if you've allowed this in your life, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to repent and seek him and fear him? The, The choice is yours. What are you going to do? But I can tell you, based on this passage and many other passages, that, that, that judgment is coming. Discipline is coming and is already here because God will not tolerate sin in his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this passage of scripture that's a hard one. That's one that, that we don't like to read, Lord, but it's one that is absolutely necessary for us, Lord, that we the, the believers at David's Community Bible Church that call you Savior and Lord and Master and King and Friend, that call you those things, Lord, that we might live that way, that we might kill off sin in our lives, Lord, that we might turn to you, that we might fear you and love you and know you and pursue you, Lord, to grow in our maturity, to grow in our obedience and our holiness towards you, Lord, to forsake sin, to forsake this world, to seek you and you only, Lord. May that be what is heard today, Lord. We thank you that we are saved by grace, Lord, through faith, Lord. It is nothing that we do to earn salvation, Lord. There's nothing that we can do to gain your favor or to earn salvation. That is purely a gift of yours, Lord. But those that are called by your name, those that know you, may we, the redeemed, the saints of God, may we have a a real understanding of our sinfulness, our continued sinfulness, our stubbornness, our selfishness, our pride, our hypocrisy, our fear, our greed, our lust. Lord, we so easily lie. We so easily uh, uh, pretend that we're something that we're not. We so easily fall into these sins and they ensnare us so easily, Lord. Help us to forsake sin. Help us to take the time that we have left, the breath in our lungs, Lord, to seek repentance and to seek you. To seek you, Lord. Help us to take this warning to heart today, Lord, that we are like Ananias and Sapphira, but there is time, unlike Ananias, there is time for us to repent, to seek you, to grow in the fear of the Lord. May we use that time, Lord. May we use that time, Lord. I pray these things in your name. Amen.